Kevin. Hello. I don't expect you to remember this, but I think that when you were born, you were born smiling. You're, oh. you're the only baby in the world who was born smiling. <laughs> Apparently, Kevin means born comfortably. Really? Well, so I think I'm... I think I was comfortable. Hopefully mum was, but she probably so, wasn't. So did that name, was it chosen after the event? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I don't know where the name came from in our family because my brother's name is Bernard and he's always hated his name. But we've since found out that Bernard was the main character that came out from Ireland that right. started my mum's side. Right. Yeah, yeah. Criminal, but, but uh, real character. Well. So Bernard Sloan, yeah. So there we go. Yeah. Now, now, tell me. Before we can talk about Kevin, we need to talk about Alice, by the sound of it. By uh, who? Your your dad. Yeah, Ellis. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me E-double about L-I-S. Ellis. For a minute, I thought you forgot your father's name. No, no, <laughs> well, I thought you said Alice. Oh, okay. But it's, it's Ellis. Easy, it's my Ellis. New Zealand, uh, wow, New Zealand accent, crikey. So, yeah. Oh, well, my dad. Oh, boy. How do you talk about your dad? I mean, you know, when they're so important. But anyway, he was the sweetest man. Humble as, very fussy with music, great, great accompanist, tenor singer, and he's boy soprano champion when he was young, Brisbane. His mum was expert accompanist. His mum was tough and taught them all piano, and Dad taught us at home. Dad wasn't tough on me at home, but he was tough on Bernard with the piano. So, so why do you think he was tough on Bernard? Did you think that Bernard was, the was going middle... to be good and you were going to go into Well, jazz? Bernard was very good. <laughs> Bernard was very good. Yes. Um, Bernard had the best sound. Right. But, um, um, no, Bernard will always speak back to him. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. I, I'd always just go with the flow, you know, yes. avoid the conflict. So your father was classically trained? Yep. Okay. Very good. Loved Lindley Evans, who he, was here. Right. He loved the uh, Rhapsody that Lindley Evans composed. Yes. Can't remember any of it now. Russell Springs, another one he loved. So, yeah, he had great sound, great great technique. So much so that um, uh, Simon Tedeschi and I have done a lot of playing together. Sort of jazz classical, but I tried to come to him classical-wise. Um, and but, but then he would do his big concerts and he'd prepare often with Beryl Potter being his coach yes. and occasionally I could take dad to those preparation sessions well they were trial concerts yes and so I'd bring dad along and so I'd be playing something phenomenal um Beryl would be playing the other piano or I don't know what but but then I remember one time dad played for Simon and and Simon thought he had a great technique you know he could see that all the preparation isn't that great yeah 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 Yes. So, yeah, Dad was the sweetest man. That whole thing of family first. So he had big jobs. He worked in the bank, a career. And I think he did well and loved it. But come the weekends or Friday's, Friday um, daylight saving, we'd be down the beach. He'd, he'd get us down there or he'd go camping. Or So he's family first. On the weekends, I don't remember him ever working. But then later on in life, when he had the big, bigger job, he said he would get up at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. and sit in the chair he's got next to the bed with a solution to a big problem. So, so he would work around the clock a bit, but never on weekends. And your piano lessons with him, yeah. with him were a joy? Uh, I can't say they were a joy, they were a chore. Right. So when you turned six, you learnt piano. Yes. And it was a chore for Dad. Yes. Before work. So at what point what point did it become less of a chore? Um, as soon as my brother, my older brother, so I've got two brothers ahead of me and a sister ahead of me, as soon as my older brother came home interested in the blues, don't know don't know what how that first happened, but it sparked Dad's dad's memory of Boogie Woogie. So John came home from school one day saying, Oh dad, I learnt this blues started playing on the piano and dad said oh that's like albert emmons dad got out his old boogie book and ripped through this boogie that he'd learnt years ago and john got the bug so that made john get right into his hennon of all things yes and this big velocity of playing yes and i heard my brother's love of music then so john would be practicing all the time how many pianos did you have in your house just the one 
So was there a bit of a bit of a schedule going on? Who could... Not really, no. But John was just the best. Yes. At it, so he'd be more diligent. My sister had been her in practicing violin, so there was. But yeah, but um, but I just heard John's love of rhythm. Yes. Unlocked by that boogie, and so then, sure enough, he he became an electronics whiz, and he built amplifiers. Actually, built a synthesizer for his for his thesis of for his major work of electronics. And um, and so I so then the next brother down had a band that was even better than John's band playing Led Zeppelin. Yes. And then I was in the next band down, my group of friends, and we were rough. We weren't as good as them, but we worked harder. I so think. you played on keyboards? Yeah, and trumpet. We all played oh, brass. You played, you played trumpet. Yeah, yeah, we we were in the brass band at school and okay. all that. So 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 music at school was was was. Good. Great for you. Marty Mooney, do you know him, the saxophone player in Galapagos Duck? No. He's only just passed away, but his brother was a Christian brother, John Mooney, who yes. taught us. Right. So, so music was, was Yeah, pop. yeah. He was a violinist, yeah. John. Yes. Not very good, but he but he's so keen on music. Yes. So um so yeah, so Dad and John Mooney Dad was the treasurer of the band. Dad Dad was So which brass band was this we talking just about? Just St. Pius the tenth. Right. You know, we're in the we we're in the Christian Brothers School, but right yes. next door was Willoughby with Peter Walmsley. Okay. Right. So, you know, no comparison. <laughs> but but um but Keith Kellett came to us yes. from Sutherland. Yes. I think John Mooney sussed him out. Keith Kellett was like a Don Burroughs. Yes. Like an instinctive musician who would listen to sound and tell you about it. Like Don used to. Yes. So, so Keith was one of those. So Keith would make us play hymns in the morning. We'd be freezing. That's, you know, way back, early 70s, um, in a wooden shed. Be cold, but he'd make us play long notes and listen to the trombone while you're playing that note. So th that's the sort of thing Don... And, and as it turned out, I was on a golf course with Don, just mucking around, I think, after a gig. And he mentioned Kellett, the name Kellett. And I said, oh, do you mean Keith and Harry Kellett? Yeah, Kellett Brothers. And I said, oh, he was my first really great music teacher. Yeah, so Don did studio sessions with those guys. So, Kevin, after you finished school, what was next? I went to catering college. I wasn't very good at school. Well, after year 10 at school, I lost interest in school. Um, How did you go at catering college? I wasn't expecting to say that. Yeah, yeah, catering college was good for me because it was tactile and I was already working in restaurants in my last two years of school as a waiter and sometimes driving the van without a licence, but anyway. but um, I'll delete that later. Yeah, <laughs> but um, um, there was a piano player in this restaurant, Schweizerhof in Wurunga, and, um, and I used to think, well, that's something I might do play the piano in a restaurant and maybe own the restaurant. So I went to catering tech, quickly found out to own a restaurant is very dangerous. You don't do that unless you've got a lot of play money. So that went out the window. But so then I was just in the kitchen learning. I'd love, love being in the commercial kitchen learning about it, but I wasn't good enough. I failed cookery. But I loved the uh, floor on the floor, doing the front of the house and all that. But anyway, so it was going pretty well. I was at Catering Tech, just playing in amateur rock bands. And Lynn Batten was... Um, Muso's Union here uh, had an agency. And for some reason, maybe through Dave Levy's jazz workshops at the Muso's Club, Saturday afternoons, I got to know Lynn Batten, maybe. I can't remember now. But she used to find me work. So what sort of work was that? Playing at piano bars or... There was work everywhere then. Yes. So I, I was in a band playing in pubs, a rock band. Um, and she would send me out sometimes playing Waterville shows. I was very green, but she'd send me out and I'd go on these little tours and back and act badly. Um, and then one day she rang up. She said, um, Ross Ryan's looking for a piano player. And Ross Ryan was someone we grew up with. He had a, um, a big big hit, a couple of hits when we were younger. I thought, wow, Ross Ryan. So and she said, there's an audition at such and such studio. So I bought all the records I could and, and songbooks and learnt a lot of songs of his 
turned up to the audition and got in to the band. It was a professional rock band who were going on tour. Did you have to buy a new wardrobe? Or... <laughs> Probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I went on the road with this rock band against my mum and dad's wishes. They wanted me to stay at, at Tech. But I did go. I shouldn't have probably. But I, but it was good to feel what it was like to be a professional musician. We hadn't really had that notion in our family that there was such a thing as professional music. And then later on we found out that Dad was a professional entertainer when he was a boy. He was a tap dancer, vaudevillian. Hadn't told us that, that it was professional and that it stopped all of a sudden when he heard his mum having an argument with someone. So there's probably problems with pay. And she just took him out of it. Mm. So and said then, you're gonna work in a bank. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So so that was the end of that. He 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 was up to the age of ten, I think he was a vaudeville, a tap dancer, singer, worked with a theatre troupe. Yes. They used to do the hospitals. How extraordinary. Lot. Yeah, yeah. So from this rock band. Yeah. So the rock band was too hard for me. Tough people. I'm an all shore boy. Yes. So I'm on the road with this rock band. And um, it was a tough life. But three months, I think, I lasted. Left the band. Well, actually, I tried to audition for another rock band. And I didn't get in, which is probably a godsend. Because then I went... I knew that I liked professional music. So I got a job in a country and western band playing weddings and functions. And I had to change my wardrobe for that band because they they had very corny silk red shirts I floppy hope ones the, I, hope, I hope those none of those photos <laughs> and that band was already corny in the name it had five people so it was called five wheel drive but it was great fun and the guys were really easy to be with ex-vietnam fellas so we often played at the army barracks yes great people easy simple Yes. And they let me do a piano feature. and Yes. So then eventually, after three years of auditioning, I got in here. To the yeah. con. Yeah. I kept not getting through the audition, so eventually I got in. And this was with Don? Yeah. And that changed my life. So how, how long had the jazz course been running? Uh, probably, because that was 81, probably uh, 10 years. Right. I, I think it started 72 just guessing. We don't really know. I've got to look that up. So can do you remember the audition? Who auditioned you? Kid? Oh, well, um, well, I don't remember the first audition. It was on trumpet. Did, didn't get far with that. And then came back, did piano. And on that audition, I'd already had lessons with Chuck Yates by that stage in Annandale, a wonderful teacher, jazz teacher. Um, but on that panel was Betty Motzing, Don, and Roger, I think, Roger Frampton. Yes. And again, I failed the sight reading, but got through the blues. And Betty said, you should... Oh, no, I hadn't had lessons with Chuck. Sorry. You should go to have lessons with Chuck, who everyone had been learning from. Paul Mack learned from him, Betty. So I went and had lessons with Chuck. Kept up the catering tech. So it was all a bit mixed up, my memory with all that. But, um, um, and Chuck used to hassle me a lot, which was probably good. Um... And then I came back for the third audition, third year, didn't get in again, only because of the reading. Everything else was fine. And they said to me, I think Don must have said, we can't let you in if you can't, if you can't read that, but you're playing well. So luckily I got into the Northside Big Band and learnt to read the jazz music. I'd only done six grades of piano, but I hadn't really learnt how to read jazz rhythms. Yes. Um, so John Spate took me on down there at Harvard in the training band. So that's going well. Mum said to me, because my friends got in that year, so we had a band and they got in to the jazz course, Tony Buck and Hugh Fraser. And um, Mum said to me, write Don Burroughs a letter, tell him that because we heard that they didn't take any piano players that year, and tell him, remind him that you did well in the audition except for your reading and tell him now that you're reading down at the big band. So I wrote him a letter and he answered it. He said, great, come in. Oh, no, that's right. Oh, no, 
sorry, sorry, I've got that wrong. I came in with my friends to play concert prank because we had a band and yes. they were already in and they yes. needed to be, they needed. So, so I played with them and Don said to me, why didn't you audition uh, for the course? And I said, well, I did. So that, that just fizzled. And so I went home and told mum. She said, write him a letter. Look, aren't mum's the best? Yeah. Are they the best? Yeah, she, so she said, write him a letter, tell him that you that he said, why didn't you audition? And uh, tell him you auditioned and tell him you're reading. So he said, come in for an audition. And you did another one? I did another one. I don't remember doing that, but I must have done it. Yes. And uh, yeah, got in. Fair dinkum, going through those front doors, those old front doors, feeling like I was part of the place, I felt like I'd gone to heaven. Fair dinkum. Yeah. That you could just think about music for the next two years. I was, wasn't very good at it, but just to be in it. Yes. And to go to class. No, I wasn't very good. Roger taught me one year on piano and I was a bit, it was a bit hard learning from him. He was a bit, very exacting and I couldn't quite keep up with him. And I did have a go at him. I shouldn't have. I did say, you're only going to be happy if I play it your way, I think, or something. And I shouldn't have said that because... No, probably never a good thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but Paul McNamara was a teacher that would teach you where you were at. Yes. He wouldn't come down... Get yes. this, 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 and this done. Yes. So um, that's influenced your teaching. Of I, it sort of has. I was just thinking then fast yeah. that this year we're working on technique, so it is a bit of a top-down thing. Yes. I am prescribing a bit. Like that last student that was here is excellent. Yes. But he needs just a bit of, um, what's the word? Is it resilience? He needs just a bit of strength. So, so we're just doing very simple Rhythm exercises, not that simple, but but that's a bit prescribed. So, so you work, you're working with Don Burrows. Yeah. Little did you know, as you walked through those doors, when you suddenly felt as if you'd gone to heaven, that you're going to actually have a lot to do with Don over the years. Don was always familiar to us, and I think it's because of In the Wild, Harry Butler. That was the first really classy nature show in, in Australia. We had the Leyland Brothers before that. Yes. And then all of a sudden, ABC did a partnership with BBC in the wild, Harry Butler. And the, the title is this Death Adder coming across and Don's bass flute. Boo, 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 boo. And we grew up with that sound, knowing it was Don Burroughs. Don was on the radio Saturday mornings with someone, maybe, maybe I'm guessing now, Carol and Jones, doing a request program. People could ring up for a request. And would he play? Or would yeah. He, yes, he would and, play. And he'd be very chatty. Yes. So I felt familiar with Don. He was Northern Beaches. Yes. We were all surfers. And the first thing he told us here was have another life to music. Don't just do music. And he said, I'm a, I'm a fisherman first, photographer second, musician third. Fourth thing you have to do is save money and buy a house. So he was telling us all these practical things, and this would be a big band or something. And he would take he would take off early in the afternoon, usually, and go fishing. Or he'd be here six o'clock in the morning, or leave home six o'clock in the morning, but then he'd always leave around three and he'd fish every afternoon. So why do you think he said, gave everyone that advice? Because it worked for him? Yeah. And because he knew the foils of staying in music. He had too many friends that fallen apart with alcohol or depression. Yes. I only found that out later. You know, some of his heroes, mm -hmm. all of his heroes in Sydney, just yes. about were Casualties. dead mm -hmm. because of alcohol or... Mm. Poor. Yes. And he grew up through the Depression. So he knew the so, importance of having... But he was so generous with all that. Like, you know, some people would keep that to themselves and compete. Yes. But he was telling us straight out. He was... Save your money. He was such a born communicator, wasn't he? Yeah. The most wonderful communicator. So there's no ego there, for I reckon, in that part of Don. 
certainly there's an ego in himself. He would be hard on himself mm. with his playing. Mm. He would get quite stressed. So there's just so many aspects to your life. So I want to jump over yeah. uh, and ask you in a provocative way, how was your time at Long Bay? <laughs> <laughs> I reckon I still think about that every day. You better explain quickly. <laughs> <laughs> five years. I say it's five years. It probably was it probably three or something. But that was through TAFE. But a big time in my life was... You better quickly explain what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, I taught music at Long Bay. Yeah, Chris. yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Now tell the full story. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I've done plenty of crime, though. Just never got caught. Um, but um, uh, so... I had a big move from being a North Shore boy to move to Redfern in 1983. Again, my dad um, said, you know, I was living with Phil Trelaw, the drummer, and we had a great muso house, um, but I was paying $60 a week rent, and dad said, you know, that's really dead money. You really should be... Um, gee, that's Scott Ryan. I wonder if he needs me. Anyway... Um, you really should be um, thinking about Paul Keating's first home loan scheme. There was a depression, a recession, 83. Mm -hmm. You probably had your house by then in Hornsby and all that. I wasn't even in Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so Dad said, um, I was saving, I was working. I think I had a job at Channel 9. I was in the Daily Wilson Band. I was doing things backing shows. There was a lot of work in clubs. So I was saving money. Don got me the best gig in 1983, same year, at the Regent. When he started at the Regent, he gave Gary Holgate and I two nights a week on the balcony. How, how good. Mm. Um, so we were still learning songs, but he put us in there, you know. So regular income. So I was able to save up 10000 and got 15000 deposit for a $50,000 house. Moved to Redfern. No lights in the house. It was a wreck of a house, but it had a good feeling. Dad was very handy with lights, put the lights in for me. And um, Mum and Dad loved being in Redfern. They loved cleaning that house and they loved the pubs. And um, they just enjoyed it. And that really helped me that they enjoyed it. Anyway, I got my girlfriend at the time told me about the priest there. At We'd all grown up Catholic and... Um, she told me about the priest at Redfern who'd taken a vow of poverty and uh, was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. So I went to his mass and there's Mum Shirl sitting there, the most famous Aboriginal lady. And um, she's sitting there with all of her adopted kids who were altar boys or whatever, yelling at them and all that. And so I got to know her a bit and started going into the women's prison with her playing the piano. But around that same time, uh, the Pope came out. The Pope came out in 86, so it's a bit, I'm a bit jumbled with years. I got to, to play in the band for the Pope. And during that time, I met a, a wonderful lady, Tricia Watts, a singer, a Christian singer. And through her, I met Jim Hunt, who was the volunteer at Long Bay every Sunday morning. So I started going to Mass at Long Bay Sunday mornings with Jim and then playing the piano afterwards after Mass with the inmates, just casually. He did that for over 40 years or something. Got a, got a lot of awards for it, for that generosity. Um, so that just sparked my interest a bit of prisons. Also, my girlfriend told me about this fellow that she'd, turned, she'd learned from, um, can't remember his name now, but he was part of the Royal Commission at Bathurst after that riot. So I went to him and he told me about prison life. And it was, he, the, what he told me was absolutely terrible, that it was a war. Oh no, sorry. The best thing he told me about prison life was that within those four walls is society illuminated. You get to see every part of society in a multi-dimensional exaggeration. Mm. The worst and the best. Mm. And I was fascinated with that. And then, uh, but then he told me it was a constant war between inmate and non-inmate. I kind of put that out of my head. But um, 
And so then when I started teaching, like I went in as a volunteer for a long time. Then I went in as another volunteer with a playwright and we uh, we worked on uh, developmentally delayed inmates. We worked with them recreating their crime through through uh, play. That was a bit heavy, but interesting. And through that, I got a job at that place in Long Bay, that wing. So then I started going in with the developmentally delayed and also the other wing and just doing music lessons and all that. And learning about that side of things. But still, ne I was never in the mainstream prison. Mm. Mainstream's quite different. So I, I did at one stage train to be a chaplain there and that meant you had to go into the mainstream and go to a lot of prisons and that was a lot harder than anything I'd done. Mm. Uh, yeah, and risky. Mm. In, the, in the wing I was in, you got to know everyone and it was pretty fine. Yes. Occasionally things were not so good but going into the mainstream with hundreds and hundreds and you're just a, an employee or it's a little bit different, different feeling. Mm. I felt that that was a bit dangerous. I didn't do too much of that. So from there, yeah. what do we jump to? Because there's so many things. And I'm well, just I'll, just, I'll tell you about one thing that happened in prison that, well, I just remembered now. At school, I was in rock bands and we had this hall. We, had, we were very interested in girls, as, as, as we are. And um, we had a girls' school opposite us, and we actually did have co-ed in the last two years. So we were very keen on going to the beach with the girls or, or having dances, where, and we were a rock band. Girls love to dance. So one day, one lunchtime, we used to do lunchtime concerts in the Presbyterian Hall, and one day I remember playing in this rock band, I was playing, playing keyboard, and looking down, and there's all of my friends just loving it dancing. And that feeling of music was, was, I've never forgotten that feeling of, oh, wow, wow, okay. All that hard work we've done, and we're already probably stuffing it up, but we look down and there they are going, yeah, thinking, oh. So that was a real, real change for me, remembering that. And then I... Somehow similar to that is in the catering world, I used to love sitting in the restaurant before anybody came. It's all set up and ready. Just that feeling that this is all going to be happening in a minute. The show is about to start. Yeah, but that feeling of being in the space, I don't know what that's about. But anyway, then I was in prison and I used to have to lead these big sing-alongs. And it never was very good. I was pretty clunky. Usually a Rolling Stones song. Or... Anyway, one day, just one day, I thought, I'm going to try a Supertramp song. Give a little bit. And I love Supertramp. And I thought, oh, they won't like it, but I'll just do it because I love it. I started playing the riff. da 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 And I started singing, give a little bit, give a little bit, give a little bit of your love to me. Give a little bit, give a little And I look up and there's everybody, inmates, officers, female and male, all just going, give a little bit. It was sort of like a cartoon. And it was like that time in the Presbyterian Hall. Yes. And what really made it for me was that a dear friend of my family is, was the chaplain at Long Bay at that time, Michael Walsh. Vincentian priest, he was there and he was just sitting recorded just watching this thing and it was only about five minutes probably yes. less, but there was a moment where we were all just one thing Yeah. so that, that I think those, that's a prison experience yes. where we weren't allowed to make noise but you could in the music class Yes. so the, the inmates were completely taking liberty and yelling, give a little bit! You yes, know. how wonderful, wonderful. And so just jumping ahead, yeah. you have done so much for Aboriginals in Australia. Not really, no. All I've done is tried to listen, that's all. Well, you know what? And I'm still trying. You know what? 
if only all of us were doing that. Well, that's what you do. That's what Don did. Yeah, but, but even this morning I'm, I'm talking to my mentor at the moment here, and she's been here for about four years, Nadi Simpson. She's very similar to Mum Shirl. She went to school with Mum Shirl's uh, daughter, or granddaughter, who I sort of knew through the church. But um, Nadi is very directive, very good at directing, advising. Even when things are tough for her, she'll still be able to deliver or give me something if I listen. So this morning we had a chat on the phone and it meant that I was late and mucked up some appointment because I left the phone, I left the house talking to her and yes. left something important back, you know. To, you know. Yes. But um, that conversation was all about a problem she was having here with people not listening to her. Mm. And so, yeah, I haven't led any Aboriginal people. I was told not to do that. I, when, I, when I did my PhD and I involved Aboriginal people in the Stuart Piano, um, that was a way of me bringing in my past in Redfern to my study here. So that was just a heaven so time. So can, can you just talk about the Stuart, well, your, your well, PhD Wayne, project? Well, Wayne Stewart said... Well, he built a piano of um, 95 keys. Yes. And then by that time, it was 102 keys. Yes. And he said to me, you know, if you're going to do this, you've got to compose. You've got to compose new music for the piano. So, and before then, the Alberts family, who funded the PhD, much to the chagrin of, you know, academia, because I don't know if the PhD was put up to tender. I think that came to me, offered it to me, which is against yes. all the rules. But, um, um, they wanted me to do a jazz uh, comparison of Steinway and, and um, Stewart because they're thinking of business. How are we going to yes. sell pianos? Let's take on Steinway and let's get a jazz pianist to talk about the difference and hopefully there'll be some positives. So I was doing that. I was recording both with the same trio, same microphone, same everything. And, and I still haven't written that up because as we were getting to the end of that program of comparing the two... Um, Wayne Stewart said to me, yeah, that's okay, but really, it's a new instrument. It's, it needs new music. And that just changed everything. And I walked down the hill here and saw the timeline, the Aboriginal timeline that's there. Ooh. I worked, walked further on. I'd, I'd, I had met Clarence Slocky, I think. Maybe I hadn't. And I made an inquiry at the, at the Botanic Gardens. What do you know about Aboriginal history here? Because I've got a new Australian instrument that's a new sound that might be interesting with the oldest Australian music. We might get something. And they all went, really? Oh, go up to um, Ronald Briggs up here at the library. I think it all happened in one day. I went up to Ronald Briggs, told him what I was doing, and he said, oh... There's just been a discovery made in London of Benelong's chant that was the Sydney chant because he sang it in London and someone transcribed it there. Oh, when I say someone, sorry, I, I used to know that name. An important fella, a musician who was there. Oh, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, um, so all these stars aligned, lined up. Um, so, so I got the transcription from... Um, from Keith Vincent Smith, the historian who was tracing Benelong's steps in London. And we did a reenactment of the song in London for the State Theatre, and they've kept that recording the whole time. I taught it to a couple of Aboriginal singers, Clarence, who's a beautiful baritone, and Matt Doyle, who's since lost his voice, but beautiful man and great, still a great elder and everything. Um, so anyway... Um, so, oh, what am I saying? So, so Aboriginal people started coming in to the con to do this work with me. And we developed a thing with the help of Eora Tafe and Chris Sainsbury Festival every year called Our Music, where we do workshops, Saturday afternoon songwriting, and then put on a concert. Deborah Cheatham came up for one of those. The dean here was amazing for it. You know, Kim Walker, she just kept saying, yep, do it, do it, do it, do it. In those days, $3,000 went a long way. And she'd give us $3,000 and I'd be able to pay, I don't know what, but maybe Deborah. 
So we'd, we'd pay, we had Jessica, Jessica, Jessica. Oh, I've forgotten her name, damn. Jesse, Jesse Lloyd, who's uh, Joey, Joey, um, oh God, I've forgotten his name too. He wrote the important song for the flag, the colours of the flag, Joey Geyer. So Joey Guy is a, a tradi uh, legendary Aboriginal reggae artist from the 70s. Really important in Aboriginal culture, that reggae period. Um, Jessie's his daughter. She came up and gave us a whole time for our music. Um, yeah, so got friendships there that have carried on. So I didn't lead that. I just opened the door and Kim provided the money. The very first one we did, now that I'm thinking though, was Anna. Anna was the dean. Well, hang on, couldn't have been. But anyway, she was the first dean to um, to come on board. Well, I must be talking about that. Anyway, I just remember Anna coming up on stage, Aboriginal people in the Verbruggen. She says, welcome back. Like, welcome back? What do you mean, welcome back? That was her first address, welcome back. So I asked her, what do you mean, welcome back? She said, well, she's pretty sure she read in Trove or the Sydney Gazette that this was the site of the first land claim when or the first dispute about land when, uh, what's his name, Baldwin put the footings in for their windmill here mm -hmm. long before the stables were built um, because it's high, it was probably a ceremonial ground. Well, let's face it, it's choice real estate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she reckons she read somewhere. I can't find it, but I'd love to have that. Proof. So, so Kevin, moving on, you're yep. now from Catering College. Yep. You didn't expect to end up being Dr. Kevin Hunt. No. Lecturer at the Sydney Conservatorium. Yes. You didn't expect that. What's, no. what's next for Kevin? Fix up my tendons. Lunch. Yeah, that was, that was a bit careless. Got, got yeah. 12 weeks of... Yeah. I was playing with a student, though. I'm working out a way of four fingers. But, um, yeah, that's a problem. What's next for me? Sorry. So I'm being... Well, no, 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 no. I mean, apart from lunch. Um, next for me is to realise what how Dad lived. Family first. Yes. So I've never been able to do it. Right. So that's my challenge. Yeah. So there's been a few failures along the way. My marriage isn't great. We live separately. We're putting up with it. We still wear the ring. We do our best. But... I can say that my job and my passion for music has enabled me to separate from the marriage, which is terrible. But it's it's giving us a life. But I think I've got lessons to learn, you know? You're a young man. Yeah. You will learn them. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, you, you really are an Australian musical treasure. But much more than that, I think you're probably a great loss for the catering world as well. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Certainly not in the cooking. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>